All right, this is Stephanie Trong with The Patient Story, and today I'm incredibly excited to welcome Lee Jones, um, who's here to share his story with us about um, colon cancer. Um, Lee, welcome. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. Glad to be here. And, you know, yours is a really inspiring story, and it's going to be definitely for a lot of people. So we're, we're so happy to get it today. Um, first things first, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling fine. Um, I'm really lucky. I have no real health issues. And in fact, I've just recently been able to get the 150 minutes of exercise that the American Cancer Society recommends for cancer survivors. So I'm, I'm doing well. I'm exercising more than I was before the coronavirus. That's amazing. Well, sh we should do like a whole separate video on that. And by the way, I haven't touched like 10 minutes of exercise. So that's really good. <laughs> um, so, you know, let's, let's, let's dive right in, Lee. I, I know um, it was a, a pretty big diagnosis. Um, can you just sort of start with what was it that first alerted you that something was wrong? Well, it was actually kind of totally unrelated to what, what was wrong. Um, I was 55. And let me just start off by saying that I did not have a colonoscopy. I had no risk factors. I never smoked. I was not particularly overweight. Oh, I've lost 40 pounds since, since then. Uh, exercised fairly regularly. Hadn't eaten red meat in 30 years. No family history. So, and I was busy. Two kids, uh, teenage kids, senior executive job in the government. So I didn't bother with the colonoscopy. Well, it turned out that I had a, uh, it turned out to be a prostate infection. Uh, I went to a urologist. I'd had one before, had gone to him. Uh, he gave me an antibiotic. It didn't take care of the issue. So he had me get a CAT scan just to see what else might be going on. And it turned out that they found five spots on my liver. And I just happened to be back at the same hospital that I had been to six months earlier where I had ended up being pneumonia and pleurisy. They thought it might have been appendicitis because the pain was really low in, in my abdomen. And the same radiologist said, oh, these spots weren't here five months earlier. You can have spots in your liver, but they shouldn't be growing in five months. So that's, that's when they recognized something was wrong. I went back to the urologist. He said, you need to go see your doctor. I saw my doctor. He said, you need to see a gastroenterologist. That same week, I went in for a colonoscopy, and they found the primary tumor in my colon. Wow. I mean, it's just like, especially when you recount it, it's just like, bam, 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 one thing right after the other. Was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally unexpected. I mean, I had no clue that was going to happen. Do hadn't been sick. Hadn't been feeling badly. Right. Um, do, do you remember sort of um, how you were able to even process or was it not processing? It was like, oh, okay, I have to do this. I have to do X, Y, Z. And it's just moving from one to the other. Yeah, it was pretty much the latter. I think it was okay. Tell me what I need to do. I mean, this was back. So I'm, I'm an active cancer research patient advocate now, but back then I don't know whether advocates really existed to any extent, maybe in breast cancer they did. Um, and so it was, you know, I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. Right. First saw a surgeon who said, well, we don't normally do surgery first at Georgetown University Hospital. You should get chemotherapy first. Um, so I didn't even know how to go about doing that. So it was just a matter of, yeah, I'll do whatever. Um, I didn't know any better. So... Yeah, and, and I'd love to discuss some of your work, you know, um, at, the, at the end of this too, because it is very important. Um, in terms of the, the biopsy, so they had gone in with the colonoscopy, removed the tumor then, I guess, and then biopsy. No, no. no. A, a tumor is bigger than a polyp. So a polyp, they can remove a tumor they can't. They can take a bite out of the tumor and get that biopsy. Right. But the gastroenterologist could tell from looking at it that it was highly suspicious that it was cancerous. Right. Right. My apologies. Yes. A polyp, not the actual tumor itself, but they right. did biopsy right. it and that confirmed that it was cancer. Right. Right. Yeah. Do you remember um, how long it took uh, to get those results and 
had had the had the person actually told you right after the colonoscopy it looks cancerous yeah yeah so uh that didn't hold things up and what held things up was trying to figure out what to do next i think my wife called the national cancer institute helpline to you know ask what to do uh she talked to her doctor who had a relationship with georgetown university we were in the northern virginia area she knew some people at Georgetown, so that's why we ended up going to, to Georgetown. Uh, but things happened. Well, they got started fairly quickly, but everything takes much longer than you think it's going to take. There's a lot of waiting. I'm really glad you brought that up, Lee, because <laughs> I think it's one of those things that um, as a, even before you're officially a cancer patient, even if the word is just hanging over your head, I think a lot of us are, are like, okay, well, the, the fire alarms are going off. Like, let's get this figured out now. Let's, I mean, yeah. obviously everyone's gonna, gonna be in line to help us, right? But that's, I mean, obviously there's a system and it's serving many more people than, than just us. So can you give people a sort of understanding of waiting and the process? Yeah, well, I think a lot depends on the particular type of cancer that you have and how they're gonna go about treating it. So even with colon, uh, I'll call colorectal cancer. I had colon, but colorectal are treated differently, but they're similar. Uh, they're referred to the same way as a lot of, a lot of times. But um, so one of the drugs I was gonna be getting, something called 5-FU, required an infusion over time. So I had to get a Metaport put in, which is outpatient surgery, but it's still, surgery, they still make a cut and they put it into your, your jugular, I guess it is. It's a central line, they call it. Also, one of the drugs they were gonna give me, me um, before my surgery, before my colon surgery, uh, was something called Avastin, which has effects on the, the blood system and can cause bleeding. So there's, they have to wait. So even after this Metaport was put in, they had to wait a certain amount of time before I could start getting the chemo. I couldn't get it until I had the Metaport because of the 5-FU, but because of the Avastin, I had to wait a certain amount of time. And sort of one interesting thing is I, I hadn't eaten red meat for 30 years. I had a very good diet, high fiber diet. Well, because I had a tumor in my colon, they were concerned that if it got blocked, I would need to have emergency surgery. So I had to go on a low fiber diet, eating all those things that I had never eaten for so many years and couldn't eat the things that I loved to eat. So I had to eat white bread, couldn't even have whole wheat bread, et cetera. That just made it seem, seem longer. But during this time, I had no idea really what was going on. They, had, they couldn't tell me how I might respond to the chemo, you know, what the, the, the course of the whole process would be. Um, all I knew is that I would be scheduled at some point for a colon surgery. Right, right. Um, and before we go into the details of, of that treatment, um, do you remember how you were able to, I don't know if cope is the right word, but with the waiting um, time, you know, even in the beginning when you didn't have an answer for specifically what you had, like even before you were staged, well, I knew from the beginning, since they found the spots in my liver, I knew when they found the primary tumor that it was stage four. It already spread to my liver. So I don't know if that's good when you kind of know, <laughs> you know, at least that first step, how, how bad it's going to be. Right. Um, and I remember going home after that colonoscopy and going on Dr. Google, of course, and looking at stage four colon cancer and the five-year survival rate was... 7% of people who survive five years. So, you know, I guess I was just kind of stunned and didn't think about it. I guess I was, I was really able to compartmentalize my thinking and I wasn't gonna think about that. There's nothing I could do about that. What was your uh, family with you uh, at the colonoscopy when you had heard about the primary tumor or um, how did they learn? How did you let them know about what was going on? Yeah, the, well, you're probably too young to have a colonoscopy, but the gastroenterologist comes in after the procedure and says, here's what the results were. 
I remember he gave me the, the, the picture, you know, from the scope um, and showed the tumor. I still have that. But yeah, so my wife had taken me in. You have to have a driver to come in with you. I had two teenage sons at the time. They're both now grown up. I have two grandkids and they're both out of the house, not of school. Uh, but they were teenagers at the time. And, um, you know, we told them what the situation was. And in a way, it's fortunate that they were teenagers because they had their own issues they were dealing with. And in fact, it was only recently my younger son, who's now 30, said, Dad, I never realized how seriously sick you were. Because for one thing, I didn't look like I was sick. I didn't normally act like I was sick, but I would sit in my chair all day recovering from chemo and they'd be off at school and doing things with their friends. So that was good, I guess. There's no reason for them to suffer any more than they have to. But I, I have realized that the caregiver really in some ways suffers more than the patient because the patient, all you have to do is everything you have to do. You know, give me this, give me that. I'll do the best I can. The caregiver has to do everything else. Everything they had done before, everything that you were doing had been doing before, and then taking care of you. Yeah. So I think that's really a tough, tough role, tougher than the patient role, I think. You know, I, I tend to agree with you there. And I, uh, by the way, at the end of this interview is where we'll go over a lot of these sort of big picture topics, um, including, I think, caregivers and caring for caregivers. Um, do, you, do you remember how your wife had reacted to the diagnosis and, and how she was able to process it with you or separately? Well, I think like most of us, she kind of hid her feelings. Um, I don't recall, there was only one time through this whole process that I recall fearing that I might not live but we never talked about that. Um, you know, she never broke down and, and cried. It was always, she was supportive. And one, one thing she really was good at doing was, you're supposed to be taking this medication at this time. You need to be at this place at this time. You need to be, I mean, it was more staying on schedule, doing what needs to be done, keeping the process moving uh, than, you know, tears and, and whatnot, uh, which was good. I mean, that's, even my oncologist was much more of a scientist than a, you know, there was not a lot of touchy-feely kind of stuff that was fine for me. That was kind of what I, what I needed. I didn't miss anything else, I don't think. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, so so I, I understand you've walked us through and, um, can we actually now dive into the treatment part and, and the experience there? Um, well, first for the colonoscopy, um, do you remember <laughs> what that was like, you know, in, I guess, human, human terms for people who haven't undergone one, uh, if you could just describe that for them. Well, I think for most people and for myself, it's the prep that's the hard part. Uh, the, the food prep is kind of like I was talking about you know when I was got diagnosed you have to eat really bland non-fiber food for a couple of days beforehand but you have to drink the stuff and essentially purge your system um, and that's pretty uh, uncomfortable I mean you're up in the middle of the night I think this, I, I just had one another one I have every three years now and I remember I had to take my last dose at four in the morning and you know be up until six and then go in at nine for the colonoscopy. The procedure itself is nothing. In fact, I remember the first time I said, well, what are you going to start? I said, oh, we're already done. I mean, they give you this conscious sedative and, you know, it's, it's really easy. Uh, it's the thing that Prince died from. Um, and, and so, you know, they said, well, don't, don't do this recreationally, but um, you know, it's that, it's, I wouldn't say it's pleasant, but it's not unpleasant. It's like good sleep. Mm. Okay. That's and, good. And, and then you're done. And, you know, this last time, just a few weeks ago, the same gastroenterologist that I had in 2004 who diagnosed this thing 
said, well, we found two polyps. We cut them out. There doesn't seem any problem. Uh, they were biopsied and there was no problem. <sighs> but that's kind of how it goes. So it's, it's leading up to it that's, that's difficult. Right. And of course, you hope that the, the results will be, they don't find anything significant. Right. But I would definitely encourage everyone to get a colonoscopy at age 50. I think now there's a recommendation through the American Cancer Society to get it at age 45 because younger people are getting colorectal cancer. Right. Like Allison. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, we are seeing a lot of those stories represented on, say, social media where people are being quite vocal yeah. um, about that. So absolutely, that's a great recommendation. I was going to ask about that too. Um, so, so when you um, had gone to the hospital, um, was that to get the chemo? Was that inpatient chemo or was that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's an infusion center and you know, they have had a whole bunch of chairs, recliners all around the room with curtains around them. And, um, you know, they have the infusion nurses that uh, come in and uh, so for the 5FU, they give you uh, what they call a bolus of it while you're in the infusion center. And then I had the rest of the chemo with something called uh, full Fox, 5FU, oxaliplatin, leucovorin. And then they added that Avastin to it, which coincidentally, and I think very fortunately for me, had just been approved the month before I got diagnosed. So I got diagnosed in March, and I think it had been approved in February. And so I was one of the first people that actually got it as treatment for stage four colon cancer. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so glad they had that approved just in the nick of time. Yeah, but there are a lot of things they don't tell you about. So it turned out that after 12 rounds, I started getting allergic reactions. And they said, oh, don't worry. We found that after 12 rounds of Avastin, people get allergic reactions. So they just gave me Benadryl you know, uh, and through my IV and it went away. But they didn't tell me that in advance. You kind of learn that after it happens. It's like, why didn't you say something about that? I could have been, been prepared. I, I also love that you brought that up, Lee, and in that way, because I think it, it shows up in different forms for people. So for me, it was um, a very common side effect to my chemo, but it was just, I had like 20 something to 30 mouth sores, you oh. know, and <clears throat> the first cycle and a lot was going on at the time. So it was just torturous. And then going back, talking to my oncologist, she said, uh, oh, did I not tell you about, um, <laughs> you know, a cycle of year? Like, Sure, it might not help everyone, but it helps some people. And I just thought, gosh, you know, if I had known that before, even if it didn't work with me, I think it would just have felt better, right? Like you're armed with something. You're given some sense of control in a sense. Um, so, <laughs> so I think it's yeah. interesting. It's just full disclosure and honest, and it's a trust relationship. And we trust our oncologists because we have to. But well, why do you hide that from me? Why didn't you? Just tell me about that. Um, but it, it's a little thing. Right. Um, I mean, most of the time they do disclose what the side effects of the drugs you take right. might be. Mm -hmm. I know Avastin had a lot of potentially very harmful, potentially deadly side effects. And in fact, uh, someone that I know through the colon cancer world uh, had a stroke after her first round of Avastin, so she had to deal with recovering from the stroke before she could deal with her stage four colon cancer. That didn't happen to me. I knew it was a possibility, but you know, what do we do? We, we have to assume that it'll work out for the best because otherwise we're not going to do any of this stuff. And the stuff is all poisonous, basically. Right. Any of it can right. kill you. So true. And, and to your point, you know, and I loved my oncologist too, it's they do their best and sometimes Sometimes it is maybe an intentional, well, maybe you won't get it. Why worry you kind of a sentiment? And maybe sometimes it slips their mind. Who knows, right? But I think the fact that you're a patient advocate, um, and we'll really dive into that later, I think there are a lot of messages there that people can hear um, to empower themselves to be more engaged in their own care um, if they want to be, if that's the way they want to go about it. Um, yes. And there are a lot more resources for right. patients right. now and the whole industry from the Food and Drug Administration which has your patient-centered research, 
uh, Friends of Cancer Research has patients. There are a number of things that I'm involved with as a patient advocate that I don't think existed. I mean, there was Coleman years ago. They've had patients involved for a long time, but I don't think other cancers have been, you know, had that, that input from patients. Yeah, no, it's really, I'm, I'm glad where the movement has gone and I feel grateful that I'm in an era where it's so readily available um, and it was. So if you were to give a picture, so it was Full Fox and um, you you had Full Fox plus Avastin. So right. can you describe the regimen in terms of schedule? Was it like, so how many infusions and over how many weeks and you know when the side effects started kicking in? And that uh, kind of thing? Okay, so there are two, there's called what neoadjuvant chemo, which is kind of a, a new thing, but what it means getting chemo before the surgery. Even now for a number of institutions, people that are treated for colon cancer get their chemotherapy after their surgery. But at least in my case, what they wanted to do is try to control the growth of the tumors in my liver. As my oncologist said, you're probably not going to die. No one's going to die from a, a, a tumor in their colon, but they will die from tumors in their liver. So there's a neoadjuvant, and then there's adjuvant, which is the chemo you get after surgery. Uh, so one of the side effects from all the platinum-based drugs, oxaliplatin, which is in Folfox, is certainly one of them, is peripheral neuropathy. And you know, for me, it was miserable at the time. Anytime going to the refrigerator or going to the freezer, and I'd always done all the cooking at home, so I would go into those a lot. It'd feel like burning, burning sensation, even going outside in the winter, any exposed skin would feel like it was burning. Uh, I, I know people that, who've had oxaliplatin and who've had neuropathy for years afterwards. Fortunately for me, it went away fairly quickly, even to the point that I was able to play guitar in a band, you know, two years after my treatments ended. Wow. Uh, so my fingers were still, you know, nimble, but other people, it's, there's pain and tingling and burning for years afterwards. Uh, so that's really one of the, the major side effects for that. Oh, there's another thing that I've, I've learned as being an advocate, uh, both Avastin and 5-FU have potential cardiac issues that are late effects that they don't happen until years afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one for breast cancer, I think it's trastuzumab, that they know about. And so for someone who's being treated with that drug, they will usually do a cardiac workup at the time. But there are, we found that there are these late effects that they don't tell you about, that the primary care doctors don't know about. So, I was actually at a, a patient group talking about this, and um, they had no idea that this would happen until they got to the point they couldn't walk up the stairs at home because of their cardiac issues. And it was, why didn't you tell them? And one is other things, why didn't you tell them? A lot of it's because they got treated when they were in their teens mm. for like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, mm. and the drugs they got, radiation, I think would also radiation near the heart would have that effect as well. And they, they didn't know, their primary doctors didn't know. And so it was only until they were, you know, really at the point that they could not carry on sort of a normal life that they found out they had a problem. Wow. Well, you said non-Hodgkin lymphoma. I'm going to, I had that. So I'll mark that as a, as a note for go back and check the different drugs <laughs> and, and the latest research that comes out. Um, it's ever evolving, right? What we find out about. Yes. Things. And the radiation, if you had radiation, because again, I think and these were, these were people who are, you know, my age, so they were probably treated mm. 50 years ago. Right. Right. Okay. But, but noted. Thank you. Um, uh, and before we go too far, I, I, I did want to clarify. So with the full Fox, um, you know, so for me, it was, you know, it was like six days, 24 hours in a day. Um, and then it was two weeks off and then it would start again for, for full Fox um, and the Vastin. Do you remember what that schedule was like? I think it was every two weeks and it would probably be three or four hours, but then 
So when they were done with the, uh, the infusion, they then hooked up the pump. And so I had a fanny pack with a pump. And so I think it was 32 hours that you had that, that infusion. So then I would have to go back in. And so, you know, it's really hard to sleep with that thing on. Sometimes in the middle of the night, the pump would clog up and would start beeping. And, you know, it just was, was a nightmare. I mean, one of the things I, I do believe in is, is if you need pharmaceuticals, you should get them. So I told my doctor I have trouble sleeping. So he gave me sleeping drugs. At one point I said, you know, I'm feeling pretty depressed. Mm -hmm. And he gave me Paxil for depression. And it was kind of up to me then when I was finished with everything to say, well, I don't really need this anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I shouldn't have any trouble sleeping. I'll stop this. Right. Um, I have no reason to be depressed. Now, I, I sort of woke up one day and said, oh, I'm fine. I don't need this. So I worked with my primary care doctor to wean off of uh, the Paxil. Mm. But if, if you have issues, you know, don't think that, oh, I have to be strong and I can't, I can't weaken to that. And I remember back, again, it was 15, 16 years ago, they gave me so many opioids you know, back then it wasn't a big concern, but I'm sure the thought was, I'm not going to live anyway, so why worry about it? And, you know, if you have pain, deal with the pain. If you have depression, deal with the depression. If you have constipation, deal with that. If you have diarrhea, deal with that. If you're vomiting, take an antiemetic. You know, don't, don't just feel you have to suffer through everything right. because there's enough suffering to go around. 100%. And so again, another point I'm glad you brought up, which is part of the be your own advocate, because you know what you're feeling. They usually have something for you. So ask for it, right? Just don't yeah. be shy. Um, I like that point. I also like that you brought up the pump for people who do have the chemo and have to the, do the take home pump, which I, I did. And I have nightmares still of the whirring noise, like not even just the alarm <laughs> going off, but just like the silent purring of the thing and going to the shower with it and everything. And yeah. any, any, any guidance for people who have to deal with the pump? I think they have much more sophisticated ones now than 15 years ago. Um, I, I just found part of the problem was being able to roll over at night because you hit that and then you can't roll over. You wake up and... I uh, just never got a good night's sleep, but um, no, not really. Again, just do what you have to do if that's if that's what it takes, um, you know, to get through the process. Right. It's, it's not it's not fun, but you know None it's necessary. It <laughs> right, right. Um, it's not fun. But I, it's I still I still have my metaport, as a matter of fact. Most people don't have them, but I kept mine in because I wanted to be able to remember what I went through. You know, a lot of people want to forget about the process, but especially as, as an advocate, I want to remember because I'm talking to people, you know, who have the, the issue or I'm talking with doctors or researchers that are doing research on this. And it helps me remember what it was like to be a patient and on the other side of this whole process, not on the side that I'm on now. That's incredible, Lee. I've not heard anyone do that. I think that's a whole other level of commitment to remembering and your way of memorializing that time you went through um, and connecting with people now. And, and since you brought it up, actually, I mean, did you have a good experience with the port and, you know, having it accessed? I think sometimes people get a little bit nervous about having a foreign object put there. Exactly. That's my first thought was, oh, my God, I have a foreign object inside my body now first time ever i never had any never been in the hospitals never and that sort of thing so it's ironic that now that i i have it in but actually i have to go into the infusion center now every two months more or less two or three months so and, and actually i get to talk to the patients who are in there for their their chemotherapy i get to talk to the oncology nurses i get to uh, it helps me stay connected um as well so the only time Again, it was sort of ironic. The only time it had gotten plugged up was when I was in the hospital having it accessed regularly. Otherwise, I have great blood flow coming through it. I've never had a problem with it, even if I go well beyond the suggested time frame getting it flushed. 
but in the hospital one time, it plugged up and they had to give me what TPA is, what they call it, the clot bluster, bluster to go in and, and um, uh, open it up. I figure if it does get closed up, I might just get it taken out. I mean, I'm not using it, but uh, because of this, well, this MGUS monoclonopathy, monoclonal gammopathy thing, I want to keep it in just in case I need to start getting some sort of another infusion and I don't have to get, you know, get the veins hit. They can go through the, the okay. metaport. Okay. And we will touch on, on the MGUS um, after we go through this. So people understand what that, what that is, yeah. why that's coming up. Um, so how many, how many um, cycles of full Fox did you have to do? So I think that I had I think I had 12. So I had pre -ad, neoadjuvant, adjuvant. Those would have been six and six. Okay, got it. And then, uh, so before the surgery and after the colon surgery, it was a right hemicolectomy. So they took out I don't know, 20 inches or so of my colon to make sure they get, got the margins. I yeah. uh, had no problem with that surgery at all. I thought, oh, this yeah. is pretty easy. Um, and then when I was finished with that, so I had to have CAT scans every three months mm -hmm. to see what the status was. And after I finished that, so the other six rounds would have been like 12 weeks uh, after the, the surgery, um, I had no evidence of disease. I thought that I was cured. Wow, I had my colon surgery, no evidence of tumors in my, or spots in my liver anymore, no tumors in my liver, I'm cured. Well, again, they never told me that chemotherapy typically does not cure colorectal cancer surgery cures it. And I, so I found out about a year later when the, the cancer recurred or showed up again in my liver that no, it hadn't cured it. I was just, they call NED, evidence of disease. And then I'd have to go through liver resection, liver surgery. Right, right. Right. I mean, so much, so, so such a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. Such a roller coaster um, you had to deal with. Um, before we, we go into the liver surgery, and, um, you know, really glad they figured it out then <laughs> to, to do this, um, I want to clarify. So it was six, six uh, rounds as a neoadjuvant chemo. Then you had the colon resection. Then you right. waited about three months. Um, and then another you six rounds. A, another six rounds. And, right. and, and the, uh, the next six rounds, there was just a slight change, right? You said it, it had changed uh, one drug. No, th this was so after the no e evidence disease when it occurred back yeah. in my liver, my oncologist said, well, just in case your tumor's gotten, you know, used to the oxaliplatin, mm -hmm. they went with the rhino TCAN. Full Fury okay. rather than Full Fox. Yeah. So otherwise it was the same as just the Rhino TCAN. And the difference is the Rhino TCAN tends to have more gastrointestinal issues and not the peripheral neuropathy. I like to mix it up for you. <laughs> yeah, well, mix it up for me, but also mix it up for the, the cancer, apparently. Because you know, cancer cells can't get resistance mm -hmm. to the, the chemotherapy drugs. And I'm mean, still trying to find, figure out why that is and how to overcome that. But one way to overcome it is to change the drug. So even if there's the cells that had resistance to it, then the other one might, might come through and kill it, which is indeed what happened. And the other sort of interesting thing was after it had recurred. So remember I said that Avastin was brand new, had just been approved. So the head of the liver transplant unit who was going to do my a surgery looked at the CAT scans and said, I don't really think there are live cancer cells in this kind of gray mass in the CAT scan. Um, we don't really know enough about how Avastin, you know, affects those things. And so I don't think we really need to do the surgery. But my oncologist said, 
I think you really need to do that. The fact that we don't know is not a reason not to do it. We should go ahead and do it. And after the surgery, they did the biopsy of the tissues they took out and there were live cancer cells in there. So the oncologist was right. The liver surgeon was wrong. Those are tricky situations because you, you then have to figure out, I mean, it's your choice, right? You, you figure out which way you yeah. want to go. And, and how did you decide, uh, how did you make that decision, I guess, on who, whom to trust? Well, I had a relationship with my oncologist. I'd been seeing him for a year and a half at that time. Uh, the surgeon was you know, late to the, the game. Um, and so I figured I'd rather be safe than sorry. I come through the colon surgery so well that I thought the liver surgery would be another piece of cake, which it wasn't. Uh, but that's sort of another story I want to talk about it. But um, it, it just seemed like it, it makes sense to go ahead and have the, the liver surgery. Right. We And we I would love to talk about the liver surgery um, because obviously this was a big part of your treatment. Um, before we do, I do want to clarify again then. So it was six rounds before the initial colon resection, six after, then you also had, and those are both full Fox? Right. And then you had another uh, six rounds with the full Fury. Before I had the liver surgery, but there was that year in between there that I was off treatment. Right, exactly. I was getting CAT scans every three months. Okay. Um, And, okay, so so the the liver um, surgery, can you describe... Uh, what the plan was, um, and then the prep, I guess, leading up to it, and then, of course, what you remember recovering. Yeah, well, there really was no prep. The only thing, again, was I had to wait, I don't know, three weeks, six weeks, sometime between the last Avastin that I had and going through the surgery, because otherwise it could have bleeding effects. Uh, they say don't have major surgery in July because July is when the, the new, new bunch of um, residents come in. I had my surgery, I believe it was on July 3rd. My wife still reminds me there's a conference I wanted to go to as being held uh, earlier than that. And I could have had my, my surgery scheduled then, but I wanted to go to that conference. And so I did. So July 3rd was the next, next time that I could have it done. Well, it turned out that somebody, whether it was the new resident, whether, they put the drain in the wrong place. So after the liver surgery, you have, have they took out my, so with the, the, uh, the colon surgery, they also took out my appendix, which I didn't need anyway, but they were there, they took it out. So in the liver surgery, they took out my gallbladder as well. But you end up getting bile. You know, the bile has to go somewhere, and and uh, so you put a drain in to drain that bile. Well, they put the drain in the wrong place, so the bile was accumulating in my abdomen and getting infected. So from July, really, I think pretty much through September, I was going in and out of the hospital, in and out of the emergency room. I'd be at home taking my temperature all the time. You know, it's over ninety-one. For 90.5, need to come in. Uh, it was just a horrible period of time uh, getting the antibiotics all the time. Uh, they ended up putting putting a pick line in my my arm and giving me IV antibiotics at home for a month. So my wife was doing that, and then she had to take our older son to college. So we we had to teach the younger son how to disconnect that pick line because I couldn't even think about doing it because I would just get violently sick yeah. thinking about doing it. I think that's when I, I got the sickest and lost the most weight um, was from those, those antibiotics for a month. Wow. IV twice a day, right. serious antibiotics to try to get rid of this infection. So I had to go back into the, so there's a group called interventional radiology, which is not standard rate radiology, you know, not x-ray or CAT scan. It's they use technology to do other procedures. So they had to thread a tube in through my back and make sure they missed my lung to put the drain in a different place. 
so that that could start draining that bile that it was getting infected. And, you know, over time that right. worked. It took a while. Right. You know, kept, right. kept watching the, the stuff filling in the drain or not filling in the, in the, in the, the, two, the pack that I had on my, for the drain. And, and, and this, is, this is obviously a, an event unique. I mean, it's not typical, right? You usually don't have liver surgery um, in this situation and have this happen. This was a mistake made by some resident doctor, right? And, and we- Well, we that, that, yeah, that was a, apparently a mistake unless they put it in the right place and my tr stuff drained in the wrong place. I, you know, I, don't, I, I don't know. Um, we eventually got it fixed. Uh, that liver surgery was, I mean, I, I had a real hard time. I remember I was hallucinating after I, I came out from that anesthesia. And for weeks afterwards, when I shut my eyes, I could see, for some reason, it was documents. And I wasn't sure whether I was really seeing documents from somewhere or whether I was just making all this stuff up. But it was, in a way, sort of disappointing when I closed my eyes and I stopped seeing that stuff because I had gotten so used to it. But, it, but you know, general anesthesia can, can in itself have bad effects. I don't recall that at all from the, the colon surgery, but I think this liver surgery is a much longer period of time being out uh, of it and was much, much tougher coming, coming back to real life than the colon surgery had been. Right, right. The recovery, um, I know it's hard to separate, you know, the, the bile and the drain issue from the rest of the recovery from the liver surgery, but if you could try to characterize recovering from that part, um, was it, you know, just hard? I mean, I know a lot of times they like to try and get you up and walking because they want you to, to move, not, you know, um, so what was it like for you, Lee? Well, so there's um, the lung capacity as well after the general anesthesia. I remember you know, blowing on this thing and just having the toughest time. And my wife was in there and she was making me walk, you know, get, get my pole and walk around the, the hall. I kept saying, I'm sick. I can't, I can't do this. But, you know, you do it and after a while it works fine. Actually, the thing that I remember being, being almost the worst is, is you know, they have a, have a catheter in and they they want you to be able to to urinate on your own and if you can't with a certain amount of time they they threaten to put the catheter back in uh, m meaning it's a very painful process which you don't want to go through so you better work even harder at it than than you have been um but the other thing i remember too is that uh, when i was in in the room for recovery the attending physician wanted to bring some new students. I guess they were either students or fellows. They probably, I think they were young. I think they were students in to talk to me because a lot of people never have never met a patient. I mean, I didn't go all the way through med school without probably meeting a, meeting a patient or at least talking with a patient other than, um, you know, maybe doing a, a workup on, on them. But, you know, how do you feel? What was it like? You know, is there anything that, that could have been differently? Have any advice for us? And, you know, they asked, if I, if Kenny asked if I would do that. And I said, sure, I'm happy to help out. That was really one of my first, I guess, advocacy roles uh, in trying to help out yeah. other people. They could learn from me right. and also be able to better treat their patients. Absolutely. I, I wish there was more of that, right? Because it's just, it's obviously the interaction is such a huge part of their job, but the, it's not part of the medical training. Um, I, right. and, you know, all these points actually lead to another one, which is just a heads up for people who decide to go to a teaching hospital or a larger institution, right? Like I went to UCSF, which is also a teaching institution. Um, the experience varies greatly depending on where you go. Um, but for instance, you brought up a great point, maybe figure out um, for surgery when the new kids come, come on, right? Maybe you don't want to be the first yeah. one. <laughs> July 1st, don't, don't go in the beginning of July. <laughs> don't do it. Um, and yeah. then another one being, you know, um, if you're at a teaching institution, you know, they're gonna be around sometimes of these students who come into your room, right? These are things that, that people don't expect either. Part of the- Right. 
Um, you do have opportunities, though, to get, I think, the latest in, in, in treatments. In fact, you know, there needs to be some way that we can get these things out to community hospitals where the majority of patients are treated. Uh, it's not right that they don't get access to these things, especially access to some of the clinical trials that you know, they have in the, the teaching hospitals. Um, I, you know, I, I, people have recognized this as a problem, and I think they're trying to work on it. There's this, this group called NCORP, which is the NCI Community Oncology Research Program that I know. So I, I do, I'm an advocate with an organization called SWAG Cancer Research Network, mm -hmm. and we do a lot of work, especially the non-drug trials. I'm a survivors committee, so we do a lot of our trial studies through these NCORP community-based uh, centers. That's great. Um, to, to, to help increase the access in these other environments, right, um, to your point. Right. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's huge. Um, and, and by the way, I don't want to leave us hanging on that um, cliffhanger of, you know, you have this major liver surgery. You, you thankfully you recover. I mean, how long would you say it took for you to feel, quote, normal again or close to normal again? Well, I, I kind of recall it was probably Halloween. So from July 1st to October 31st. I think that's when basically the infection was gone. And then there was still the, I mean, after, so after July 3rd, there for colorectal cancer, at least there's a five year surveillance process where you get CAT scans every three months and every six months, and then once in a year, and then after five years, I remember my original oncologist was gone. I talked to a new guy who said, well, Nothing more we can do for you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Have a good life. Really? So it wasn't a great now uh, because you have no evidence of disease for five years, you're considered cured. It's more like this is as far as we go, or I don't know how they. Yeah, the healthcare establishment doesn't like to word, use the word cured um, because there is no cure for metast metastatic cancer. Um, but I'm not a medical doctor. I can say whatever I want. So I can say I'm cured right. because I haven't had any, any evidence since 2011. It's amazing. Um, so if I, if I have it now, it'll be probably a second cancer. And, and we'll touch on the MGUS uh, before we go into the quality of life um, topics. But so after the liver surgery and you recovered and you had these scans, was there ever a time where your regular oncologist had said, well, I mean, was there ever a moment for you, I guess it's very different for people, where you felt, I can take a little bit more of a, a sigh of relief or was it never really quite that for you? You know, after that one year of no evidence of disease and then they found it again, mm -hmm. I was not going to trust anything, you know, until... And even after the five years, there's always that fear of recurrence. But during those five years, every CAT scan, I, I worked out a thing where I could go to the radiology lab after my CAT scan, give them my fax number at home, have them fax me the radiologist's results so I did not have to wait for my oncologist to let me know. So I, I learned a lot through this whole process. And so I didn't want to wait. I wanted to know if there was going to be a problem. Um, and if there was a problem, I was going to just deal with it. Okay, let's go through it again. That's, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's always that fear of recurrence. I think no matter how far out you might be from your, your cancer, particularly if it's metastatic. Yeah. And you, you know that if there's one cell, there's one cell in there that they didn't get and you're, your know, immune system didn't catch it, um, that it could be growing somewhere. Well, well, since you, you, know, you, you brought up the, 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 the tactic you came up with of going to radiology and having them fax, right? I, I think that's great. You, you advocated for yourself. You thought, I don't want to wait for the oncologist to have to call me. Were there any other, I mean, do you have any other guidance for people on dealing with the weight? I mean, it could be tactics, it could be mentally how you were able to sort of try and not get so preoccupied with waiting for results. Well, you know, whatever that, that takes, I think for some people it's work. Um, you know, we wanna talk about work. 
my attitude was my primary job is to stay alive and get better. So somebody I knew, so I was a senior executive in the federal government at the time and I had, um, I guess a $20 million budget and a hundred people and contractors working for me the first time through. <clears throat> uh, and somebody else who had gone through a lung cancer situation uh, it's, well, he was at work every day, it was amazing, and he died. Well, you know, I, I guess I was willing to, to not be applauded for being at work every day and being an amazing worker, and I'd rather be an alive non-worker than a, uh, you know, hardworking dead person. So I took, I mean, I took a year off pretty much going through my first uh, round of things and um, and I, I lost three jobs basically as a result of the uh, the cancer um, you know for various reasons at a senior executive level they expect you to to perform 80 hours a week and you're not always able to do that particularly after going through the liver surgery absolutely um, I, I appreciate you bringing this up I know it, it's it's a tough situation, especially when you have worked your way up to a senior exec level. It's probably at that time had become sort of part of an identity for you. Um, did you have to sort of work through that, you know, because it was a result of something completely not your fault, having this medical situation and then experiencing job loss. And, and I don't know if there was identity issues to work through too. I mean, did any of that come up for you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it certainly did. I, I felt that I was treated very unfairly. I mean, it turned out that the deputy that I had put in that position who had thought that she should have gotten my job to begin with before I came in, ended up convincing a temporary political appointee at that organization that I was, no, I was not competent and that she should have my job. So when I came back, they were really quick to shuffle me off into nowhere, into essentially a, a do nothing job in an entirely different office that just happened to have a slot there that I could fit into. And, you know, I spent most of my time trying to find another job. And I did and liked the job that I had, but then like three months later, I got diagnosed with a recurrence. And while I was out from that job, they laid me off. I stayed on, they had a disability, long-term disability program, which I stayed on. I was on social security disability as well. Um, and then after they laid me off and after I got better, I happened to run into a guy at a conference who hired me as a deputy chief financial officer at a different agency. Um, I only lasted there a year because that was the one that I, I couldn't work 60 to 80 hours a week. Um, and then I went back to work after that on a part-time basis for another year before I started working on a more full-time basis. Yeah, yeah. Is there a message there for people and you know who are either former or still current um, workaholics or people very involved in work um, on reconciling that with going through something so um, life-changing, obviously, um, as as cancer? I think it's a matter of setting your priorities. Fortunately, um, my, my wife particularly was always one to say, I'd rather you have more time with your family than, you know, make more money. We have enough money. She, she was a lawyer for the government. Right. She had a good job. And so, you know, I didn't have to be out there working. But I know I, I had, had one opportunity between going with a big name consulting company, doing a lot of work on the West Coast. I live in Virginia versus uh, being a vice president for a bank that's based up in Pittsburgh. And she said, I don't want you on the West Coast every, every week. That's, you know, that's, we don't, you don't need that. We don't need that. So it means it's good to have, you know, a, a, a spouse or a caregiver or, you know, a significant other um, who kind of agrees with your priorities and helps you set priorities that are more reasonable than, you know, I got to get out there. I got to, I got to big the big shot again. Right. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it was tough to go through that whole, you know, devolution process after working so hard to get up to the top. But, you know, ultimately, 
being alive is, is, is much better. And I enjoy being a cancer research advocate a lot more than I ever enjoyed my senior executive job in the federal government or my job as a bank vice president or mm -hmm. my job running my own consulting company or any of those other kinds of jobs. Right. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's nice. It sounds like you found this very purposeful, um, you know, uh, living and, and it's so impactful for people. And, and, and since you brought up your wife and she sounds incredible, I, I do want to ask, I mean, a couple questions about the caregiver role. I mean, I think two parter, one is just, um, for you, what was, uh, the most important roles she played for you, you know, in terms of support. And then two, I guess, you know, how did this impact your relationship? Because as, as people know, it's, it's a big event and can, can go a lot of ways for folks. So. Yeah. Well, as I'd said, she, she was really great at keeping me organized or keeping us organized. Not that I was organized, but you got to be here at this time. You got to be doing this, got to be doing that. Um, you know, I, I know when I was recovering, I sometimes felt like, you know, when she was getting me back to normal, I wanted to be the sick guy, you know, don't bug me. I'm, I'm sick. I'm, you know, I don't want to do that. I don't want to take out the garbage can, you know, this week. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that tough love is what you need because, you know, you, the, you know, the goal is to get back to some semblance of normal. And the closer that is to your previous normal, I think the, the happier you're going to be and the happier everyone else is going to be. Uh, and it's and it's easy to kind of play the sick patient role, and um, I know there are lots of times I just did not want to. I don't want to go out and take a walk. You know, no, I don't want to walk around with that thing. No, I don't want to do this. Um, but you know, ultimately it turned out to be all for all for the the best. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, that's that's or as much as I could have asked for. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. And, and the, did it impact your relationship one way or the other? Um, I sometimes people talk about how they learned more communication too. So really it's about sort of guidance as you're, you're both now a cancer patient and caregiver also, you know, husband, wife or partner and partner. Um, no, I can't say that it really did, you know, probably like a lot of men, I'm not as demonstrative as women tend to be. I think my wife, maybe being a, a lawyer, she's not as demonstrative as, you know, someone else might be emotional as someone else might be. So we kind of, I guess, well matched in that, that area. So we dealt with things we had to deal with. Now we're both retired and literally we can be sitting six feet away from each other all day long and not say a word or two words, you know, because I'm doing my thing, she's doing her thing, and there's nothing we need to deal with. Uh, um, so it, I think a lot depends on you know, the nature of that relationship and how you communicate to begin with. But no, I, I didn't, you know, and I, did, I don't say, I can't say that I found spiritualism or, or anything else. I, I certainly did find that there are things more important in life than a job even a high level, high esteem kind of a job. But you have a senior, senior executive in the government, it's just more of a pain in the, the butt than it is anything else. It's like everyone's trying to get your, your staff and your money and your position. And you know, it's really, really cutthroat, even, even in the best of the administrations. Mm -hmm. um, now my wife was in one government office for 38 years. And she had a great, great group of people and a great great bosses coming in and she loved it but I just seemed to have in, in all my jobs I had like two bosses that I really liked out of my I don't know I think I lost count after 50 different bosses <laughs> in my career and yeah. I worked at five government agencies I worked at uh, uh, two consulting companies I was a bank vice president I ran my own business I just liked a lot of variety yeah uh, you know, the bigger takeaway that I, I hear too is just that you did learn these sort of new priorities um, and it was a sort of paradigm shift for you in a sense. Um, 
that brought more happiness and more time with family. And so I'm really happy to hear that. Um, you know, before I forget, I, I, cause I just have two more questions, but one I want to clear up is you had mentioned the MGUS and I want to point out, this does seem to be very separate from the colon cancer situation. And you mentioned it's one more about aging, um, but you had brought it up. So, so you learned you had MGUS and what does that mean? Yeah. Well, what happened was, so I was, I was back as far, as far enough after my cancer treatment that I was able to donate blood to the American Red Cross again. And so I was donating blood. And I remember I was at a, a meeting of the PCORI Patients and Outcomes Research Institute we were reviewing proposals for uh, one of their funded studies. And I got in a call from my wife saying, uh, the Red Cross called at home and said that your platelet count is extraordinarily low and essentially you could start bleeding out of your pores any second. So you need to go into your doctor's office and get your, get a CBC, get your blood tested. Okay, so I excused myself from this meeting, which is downtown DC, got in my car, raced out to Arlington to the doctor, I had the blood test, raced back into DC to the meeting, finished up the meeting. But it turned out that my platelets clumped. I remember when I was going through my cancer treatment and getting my blood, you know, do a blood draw every time before chemo to make sure that your platelet counts are, are enough and whatever, uh, then my platelets had, had clumped. So the doctor um, sent me to a, a hematologist to, un to, to do a test without the platelets clumping. He put in a purple tube rather than the other color tube. Uh, and they went one step further now my platelet counts had been kind of low anyway. So they found my platelet counts were low. My hemocrit level, I think it was, was a little bit high. And they ran this kappa lambda light chair. I, mean, I had never heard of these things before, but apparently platelets are made up of components. And among those components are heavy, heavy chains and light chains. And the light chains have kappa and lambda light chains. And normally all the stuff is in balance. But if these things get out of balance, I guess there are other cancers or diseases that can lead to, but one of them is potentially multiple myeloma, which is when the kappa or lambda light chains, I think it's either one, start reproducing. That's the monoclonal. So there's one clone, so one grandparent or parent in, that, in your body that starts overproducing, which is, of course, what cancer is. And, and apparently, it, it can be fairly common and as we get older, just those things start happening. And apparently, it's like 1% um, of people over 20 years will end up, end up turning into multiple myeloma. But what I do now is go in to this um, a different oncologist now, uh, does a, a blood draw and checks my capillary and light chains. Mm -hmm. So they've been going anywhere from like nine times to 12 times. They've been going sort of steadily up. And lately they've been, they've leveled off. So I'm hoping that maybe that's it. So I was going back. It was, you know, I went, well, actually I had to have a, a, a bone marrow biopsy and another CAT scan to check other things, could be other symptoms. Um, but I think it's the exercise that maybe is level off. I think the exercise is so important for a lot of things. And I'm doing it enough now that I think that it's, it's maybe what's helped this level off. Right. Right. That, I, I hope so. That sounds incredible that you're able to hopefully see this sort of link here. Yeah. So I'm going once a year for that now, but I was six months. Okay. Uh, really quick, I mean, was that, is it, was it sort of um, PTSD like? <laughs> yeah, I was, oh no, not again. I mean, I, I sort of thought, oh, I've got multiple, multiple myeloma. Oh boy. And then it, I'd never heard of MGUS. I'd heard of multiple myeloma, of course. Um, but actually I decided to start taking my social security before I had planned on it because I thought, well, I might not survive. Wow, I mean. <laughs> age 70. 
it's incredible what you've been through. Um, looks like those numbers are leveling off. So we're going to send you the best vibes for that to keep you <laughs> happening. Um, and, you know, the fact that you, I guess it's so cliche to say, but it's the whole beat the odds thing. Cause you look at, like you said, you looked at Dr. Google and there was that, that terrible five year survival rate. And it's, I think it's an incredible story for people just to, to, to get some inspiration from, to see that you went through it. It wasn't easy, but. You no, know, and, and there are some things that we can all do right. to try to, you know, have the best health outcome we can have. I mean, among things, don't smoke, uh, drink in moderation if you drink at all, mm -hmm. exercise regularly, uh, eat good, you know, healthy food and don't eat you know, processed meats and, um, you know, less, less red meat. The things we all know. And, you know, it's easy to not do those things mm -hmm. um, because we, you know, the, the immediate, there's a short term outcome, which is, hmm, that's really good. And there's a long-term outcome that maybe I'll live an extra five years or 10 years. And how do you, you trade those things off? And I think back when I was in my twenties and thirties, you know, I would eat and drink anything. Yeah, no, it's I a good. I never smoked. So that was a good thing, but. Yeah, you, people feel very young and invincible, right? And then it's not yeah. so later. Um, actually, that was going to be sort of my last question because Lee, you, you work now doing this patient advocacy and research and um, what are the top three, I mean, I know it's arbitrary number, but top things, I guess, you, you think are very important to get across to the, the people who are watching and reading this and, and they're probably going to be newly diagnosed patients and caregivers, but, but you know, you work with people all day long. Um, so what are the top tips and, and guidance, I guess, you have for them? Yeah, well, most people I work with all day long are research and, and doctors these days, which is, you know, there are the times I'm the only non-PhD in the room, which can be kind of intimidating. You know, and probably the most valuable voice in the room. I just, I, maybe I'm biased, but. <laughs> well, yeah, and they, they generally try to be nice even when they don't pay attention to what I say. But, you know, I, I guess the things are, you know, there are things you can do for yourself to improve your health outcome. And, you know, to the extent you can do those things, that's, that's good. The younger can start doing those things that's good because it may pay off when you're older. Number two, you know, no matter how bad your prognosis or diagnosis is, nobody knows. And you know, there, there's, there's some thinking that if I can just live another six months, they might find the cure to my type of cancer in the next six months. So you know, let's go for the extra time. I know sometimes people say, I've had enough. I don't want to do this anymore. And that's, that's fine. You know, that's what, what people want. Palliative care and hospice, you know, are things that, um, you know, that are there. People, people need that if, if, they, if they feel that they need that. You know, and the same is with, um, you know, medications, stuff that you can get to make yourself feel better and able to get through the process better. Um, that, that helps. I guess the, the third thing is, is that, you know, whether you're in treatment or out of treatment, I mean, being an advocate and helping other people is always going to be a plus for you and, you know, will make you feel a whole lot better than anything else that you've ever done in your life, probably. And, you know, it's so, it's so needed. Uh, people, patients need it. The research community needs it. Uh, hospitals need it. Doctors need it. And there are lots of different things that you can do, uh, even going in and helping people navigate through the process in the hospital, you know, or giving talks at your, your local Lions Club on colonoscopies or, you know, whatever. Um, every state has a cancer action plan. I got involved in my state, Virginia, five year cancer action plan and I'm the board of directors for the Cancer Action Coalition of Virginia, try to help my community uh, deal with cancer better. Uh, so, so lots of things you can do. So I think those are the, the big three things that I found to be most helpful for me and helped me get through this, I think, better than I was when I started. Absolutely. 
Lee, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am for all the time you've, you've given to this, this um, chat today. I've learned a lot from you. I know people um, watching and reading this will um, as well. And, you know, thank you for, for sharing your, your story with us. Really appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure. Like I said, that's why I keep my metaport. <laughs> it helps me share the story better. And uh, remember, even though my timeline wasn't, <laughs> wasn't very good. <laughs> No, it was great, and, and, and it, was, it was wonderful, and, um, and yeah, we really appreciate you, so thank you so much. Okay, great, thanks.